Our reading this morning comes from the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew, the first 13 verses. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came. He replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May we hear your word and live your word each and every day. Amen. There was an elderly man who lay dying on his deathbed. Suddenly the thought of death was pushed aside as he smelled the aroma of his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, dead man on the dead bed. Yeah, dead man on the dead bed. Um, suddenly the thought of death was pushed aside as he smelled the aroma of his favorite and his wife's famous homemade chocolate chip cookies. Gathering his strength, he lifted himself up from the bed and slowly made his way out of the bedroom and down the stairs. With labored breath, he made it all the way to the kitchen where there were freshly baked chocolate chip cookies all over, spread out all over the kitchen. Was this heaven? Was this one final act of heroic love from his devoted wife, seeing to it that he left this world a happy man? After pondering this for a moment or two, he decided he didn't really care. The important thing was to have a hot, freshly baked chocolate chip cookie. But just as he reached for the mouthwatery morsel, something stung him and caused his hand to recoil. He looked up to see his wife still swinging the spatula she had just used to smack his hand. And she said, get out of those, those are for your funeral. <laughs> <laughs> in our story was what we call prepared. <laughs> Maybe a little too prepared for what was going on in her life. In this morning's scripture, Jesus tells us a parable about being prepared or about not being prepared. To explain his point in a crystal clear manner, he relates a story of a wedding celebration that turned into tragedy for five young bridesmaids. Now for my daily Bible study series, this is what we learn about a wedding in Jesus' time. A wedding was a call for, it was a great occasion. The whole village turned out to accompany the couple to their new home. And they went by the longest route possible so that they may receive lots and lots of good wishes and blessings. When a couple married, they did not go away on a honeymoon. Instead, they stayed home for a week. They kept an open house and they were treated like royalty. In some customs, the bride and groom were even referred to as the prince and the princess. This was the best week of their lives. Their chosen friends were invited to this week-long celebration. Now, the ten bridesmaids in the parable were there to keep the bride company until the groom arrived when everyone was to go out and meet him. And as there always is in these traditions, there was rules and customs that were to be followed here. No one knew when the groom would arrive. It could be hours, it could be days. 
No one was allowed outside after dark without a lighted lamp. So it was every person's responsibility to have enough oil on hand. Once the bridegroom arrived and went inside and the doors were shut, no one else was allowed to enter. This was the situation of the ten bridesmaids in which they found themselves. Five were wise because they were prepared. They took the time to have enough oil. But the other five were not prepared. They had no choice but to leave the house and purchase more oil for their lamps. And of course, when they left, as soon as they left, of course, that's when the groom would have come and shown up and the doors were shut and they were barred from all festivities. The meaning of this parable was directed towards the Jewish people. Those that were God's chosen people should have been preparing for the coming of the Son of God. If anyone was to be ready for that person, surely it was them. They were, however, not prepared. And when God sent the Son, they were not ready. In fact, they missed out on what Christ had to offer. Now, fast forward that story 2,000 years and can we put that in today's context? So let's compare the wedding ritual of 2,000 years ago to, let's compare it to my wedding and see if there were any differences. A wedding was a great occasion, that is true. I was 34 before I got married. The church was packed. I think everybody wanted to see if I was actually finally gonna do it. <laughs> The whole village turned out to accompany or to escort the couple to their new home. That did not happen. The couple hosted a party that lasted a week and were treated like royalty. We went on a honeymoon cruise to the Bahamas and were treated like paying customers. <laughs> the ten young bridesmaids were kept the bride company until the groom arrived. At our wedding, no one was waiting for the groom to arrive. I was not late. We knew the hour I was coming. I showed up at the exact time Marcy told me to. <laughs> Jesus used an everyday celebration to explain two things. The Jewish people missed out on God's Messiah. And he addressed the belief that God and or the Son of Man would return and usher in God's kingdom at an undisclosed time. This parable by Jesus was a warning to not be caught off guard, but to be ready, to be pre prepared for what would happen. Now, my problem is, is I can't relate to the wedding celebration part of the story. It's different than what I'm used to doing. And I can't relate personally to the passage that speaks to the Jewish nation. That doesn't work for me either. And although we believe that Christ will come again, it isn't a concept that is embraced with the same immediacy or importance that it was long ago. So how do we relate this? Seems to me we have two choices. We can find no significance in the story to our lives and our faith journey, which means we can all go home right now. Or we can find significance in the scripture by the way we live as Christians today. So let's look and see how this scripture relates to our Christian walk. The first thing that this parable teaches is that there are some things in life that you cannot put off until the last moment. You shouldn't try to study for a final the night before the class. It's not a good idea to apply for a passport two days before your trip. If your doctor tells you to lose weight and exercise, you should begin that regime more than a week prior to your next visit. It is the same with Christ. That relationship deserves the proper time and attention. When we put Jesus on the back burner, our relationship suffers. If we don't give Christ our best, we are only depriving ourselves, and then we are the ones that miss out. Second thing that this passage teaches is that some things are worth the effort. This is drilled into us from an early age. If you want to be an A student, you study all the time. If you want to be a top athlete, you become disciplined all the time. If you want to be the best in your field, you work all the time. It is the same with our Christianity. If you want to be good at your relationship with Jesus, you study scripture. You discipline your life. You work at your faith. You devote your life to Christ all the time. We can't have that kind of closeness with our Lord if we are not prepared, if we are not putting in the work 
and the practice to make it happen. When we are not prepared, we miss the opportunity and the door closes and keeps us out. Third thing we learn from this passage is there are certain things that we cannot borrow or that we cannot get from someone else. The, bride, the bridesmaids found it impossible to borrow oil for their lamps. It was too important a commodity for anyone to go without. Our relationship with God needs to be treated the same way. It's too important. It is something worth having. And with Jesus, we can learn, grow, and cultivate our relationship with the living Christ. No one else can do that for us. Our faith in God isn't something we can buy or earn or feel that we are entitled to. It deserves our time, attention, love, and commitment. And it's not something that we should take lightly, but something we should look at with the greatest amount of respect. This story that I'm about to tell is attributed to the late Peter Marshall, who served as a chaplain to the U.S. Senate. And if that's not good enough for you, he was also from Scotland, so that should, <laughs> that should pretty much do it. Th this story is called The Keeper of the Spring, and it is about a village in the mountains of some picturesque tourist community, you, whatever you want, Austria, uh, Sweden, somewhere. And it's about a town, and this town years ago decided that they would pay this man to keep their spring clean. Up in the mountains there were lots of pools of water, and those pools of water fed the stream that came right down and ran into the town. And they paid him to keep it clean. And so every day he would pull out the leaves, he would get rid of the, the branches, he would clean the top of the water, he would make sure that the silt and the scum didn't form, and he would keep the stream beautiful and clear. And when he did this, it was nothing but a benefit to the town. Because they had such a great picturesque view, because the stream was so clear and beautiful, it kept the town healthy. It was the best water around. It attracted tourists, and as tourists came, people built restaurants by the streams and bed and breakfast, and it became a great revenue for the town. And, and the wildlife, ducks and swans and different birds would fill the, the stream and the pools to, to, make every, to show that everything was running in nature as it should. And everything was going great and the town was prospering because of this man's devotion to keeping it clean. But then one day, the town council met and somebody said, who is this keeper of the spring that we're paying money to? Who is this person? Has anyone seen this person? Do we know that he's actually doing what he says he's doing? Do we have an invoice that shows why and how we're paying him? Do we even know that he's being, I mean, is he just taking the money? Do we even know that he's doing something? And they discussed and talked and someone made a motion that the town council didn't need a keeper of the spring that they could put that money somewhere else. So they all unanimously agreed and they stop paying him and they told him his services were no longer needed and nothing changed for a while and then things started to happen with the with the stream you started to see a yellow tinge in the water there were more and more leaves and sticks that were getting into the stream park from the pools up in the mountains the swans and the ducks didn't come with the same frequency the tourism suffered and pretty soon people were getting sick because the water that they once thought was the healthiest around wasn't. And the town was starting to crumble and fall apart. So they called an emergency meeting of the town council. And the best way they could admit it, they made a mistake. And they decided that whatever it cost, whatever it took, we had to get this keeper of the spring back on the payroll. And they did, and within a few weeks, the water was clear, the tourism was up, even the ducks and the wildlife returned to the stream, and everything became beautiful and picturesque once again. Here in this story, we have a man who, who gave his love and devotion to something that was important. He put the time, 
and the care and the need into something that needed attention. He showed his love and he showed his devotion by the way he took care of the spring and the town. And I think that we owe God that same consideration with our lives. Not anything to wait till the last minute and not anything that we do half-heartedly because we've waited too long. Our lives need to be that same care and love and devotion and deliberate actions so that we can take care of God's people. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are here, that in you we know how to live and love and believe, and you can help us to do that every day of our lives, now and always. Amen.